lights, cameras, climax. After five years since his reveal at the Game Awards, a cancelled Microsoft game and two weeks of topsy-turvy controversy leading up to his release, this long-awaited sequel has finally danced onto the Nintendo Switch, precluding Halloween with a climactic good time. Today I will be reviewing Platinum Games' iconic action game, Bayonetta 3. To summarize Bayonetta 3, uh, whew, I'm really gonna have to go slow with this for my own sanity. Bayonetta 3 begins with our titular character sneaking onto a yacht for some unexplained reason before New York is suddenly invaded by your child's green jello cups. While these oddities are rampaging through Manhattan, Enzo gets a special delivery dropped onto his lap from the sky as well. Surprise! It's an Avril Lavigne. <laughs> After narrowly escaping, we find out through Universal Historian Rodan and Avril Lavigne that these green creatures are called human homunculi. Now why does she have to go and make things so complicated? These homunculi are rampaging throughout the multiverse ordered by an entity known as Singularity. According to Rodan, the world of chaos, aka Earth, is made up of countless universes, so the more universes are destroyed, the more the alternate worlds fuse together. If this were to happen, whoever is causing the destruction of these multiverses would obtain enough power to ultimately destroy the trinity of realities, apparently. In order to take down Singularity, we need to collect 5k Chaos Emerald Gears. After tasking John with finding a Dr. Sigurd, Viola and Bayonetta set off course to the land of Thule to access a gate created by the sages and witches that allows one to traverse across multiverses in order to take down Singularity and restore stability to the universe. Right off the bat, this game has no issues whatsoever letting you know that they used that Nintendo budget money up and left no dollar behind. They've hired a renowned K-pop choreographer, revamped the UI, made the UI more interactive interactive with the chapter menu and an interactive display of the gates of hell and added so much customization to not just the combat system but even customizing your very own bayonetta by changing her outfit color, yeah. her hair color, yeah. her glasses yeah. and giving each costume their own set of color palettes that must be purchased from the shop. Bayonetta 3 is the most feature rich bayonetta game so far. This game truly feels like Platinum is celebrating bayonetta in all of her glory and just like how intense the prologue is this game is constantly on high octane levels of pacing with fights galore, multiple ways to fight, and using multiple game inspired genres to add variety to the gameplay. The game naturally follows its predecessors and in incorporating these normally as you progress through the chapters, but this game turns it up a notch with getting even the infernal demons involved and using their respective characteristics to create unique and sometimes silly gameplay sections from kaiju battles with reformed trusty doggo Gamora to a rhythm game starring from demon turn opera singer demon ball another memorable part is a 2d metal gear solid inspired jean mini game where you control jean sneaking into a u.s research base or science base to find sigurd the game consistently kept me on my p's and q's with throwing something new around every corner every chapter seriously there were times where i felt like i had to take a break from the game to recuperate from how intense it feels the more chapters you play in one session i am not kidding this game throws you off a cliff and expands begs you to grab the parachute that's falling right behind you. What especially ramps this feeling up has to do with the next section I'm going to talk about, which is where Platinum Games always shines best, the combat. The combat system has evolved so much with Bayonetta 3, with the introduction of a skill tree system for Bayonetta, Viola, and each infernal demon and infernal weapon you obtain for multiple Bayonettas. Unfortunately, you can't equip different sets of weapons on the arms and legs in this game. However, you can equip two different loadouts these weapon loadouts also allowing you to change your demon form for your demon masquerade attacks and use up to three demons to summon and fight alongside you. This new combat system may sound intimidating at first as you're taking it all in on the spot as you acclimate to the game and use these tools in various combinations on top of dodging or parrying for viola as well as being able to summon the demon slaves at the last minute to counter an uncommon attack. This game's combat stands out with its diverse ways to fight with the compromise being the enemies in the this game are more difficult than in the previous two games. Now it's time for the dreaded critique section. Yes, as much fun as controlling the gun-toting fashionista which has been for these 12 hours of playtime, this game unfortunately has its flaws as well. Actually a few flaws that I want to address individually. The first of which is the performance. Do not get me wrong, this game is a very impressive Switch game, but the problem is... Ah. 
It's a Switch game. I'm aware of Nintendo rescuing the Bayonetta series, but no charitable act can hide the truth of the matter, which is the Nintendo Switch hardware truly holds his game back from being the absolute best it could have been. Especially during the fights with enemies on the thicker side, on top of you pulling out your own Gundam-sized demons to fight these giant walking towers. There was one fight either on chapter 13 or 14 where you control the enraged Madama Butterfly, and when two giant homunculi spawn, the game felt like the Matrix with how slow it was moving. Throughout that entire fight sequence, I thought I heard at one point my Nintendo Switch coughing up blood. In addition, I had to keep fumbling with my camera settings due to how frequent the camera angling in this game changes. My biggest pet peeve when it comes to playing a game is inconsistent camera angling. Sometimes the camera angle is fine when you're fighting smaller enemies, and then it's straight dookie when you're fighting giant enemies, and all you notice is that you're attacking their cankles. Unfortunately, the fights with these bigger enemies is when the game begins to feel like Batman Arkham Knight, where you can clearly tell that Platinum is encouraging for you to use the Demon Slave mechanic because it elevates the camera angle to where you can see these huge monsters in its entirety. But it's frustrating due to one, once you run out of magic, you can't summon that demon back until it replenishes to a minimum requirement, and two, it makes it difficult to keep track of both your demon and Bayonetta, who still has to be protected from oncoming enemy attacks. Speaking of keeping track earlier, another visual issue I kept experiencing was how difficult it was to see what was going on while in the middle of fighting. I thought that perhaps it was fatigue setting in the longer my sessions were, but completing this game over the course of three days, it wasn't. Each day I had problems like trying to catch the visual cues Bayonetta usually puts for when it's time to dodge, or the enemies, and even some of my attacks having this odd clipping filter. I figured out the reason why thanks to Digital Foundry's video, and the reason was due to the excessive amount of dithering used in this game. The second flaw I want to address is a flaw that will follow Platinum until the end of time unless they get someone that is not an old head at Platinum put in charge of this, and that is the story. We can be honest on this channel, we don't particularly care for the story of most character action games. We're here for the combat, to press and mash buttons, see a dance sequence possibly, and have a great time. Bayonetta 3 is no different, and granted at first, I was confused at just how much of a left turn it was from the established Umbra Witch Lumen Sage lore that was the foundation of the first two games. But as I played Bayonetta 3, I accepted the Marvel Cinematic Universe inspired Bayonetta and the Multiverse of Bad Bitchery for what it was and didn't question anything. Apparently Platinum had the same thought in mind as they seemed to just put shit into the game and did not want you to question it. And it's weird because on top of the silly moments that carry out throughout this game that makes Bayonetta Bayonetta, there are also serious moments that the game wants to convince you of the severity of the situation with the plethora of Bayonetta's and John variants dying left and right. But I could not respect these moments because the game just does nothing to build any validity with these emotional moments. The first Bayonetta variant that dies at the beginning struck a chord with me because she resembles the the original Bayonetta. Bayonetta's character has always been cemented as this dominating, over-the-top, sassy, powerful witch that has fought gods and even summoned gods to defeat gods. So to see a Bayonetta weak and on her dying breath before being destroyed into a million pieces did hit a sentimental nerve inside of me. But the thing is, when you repeat this over and over, normalization can set in, and one other thing that accompanies normalization is predictability. Unfortunately, that's what began to happen. By the time I got to Bayonetta, at a number four is when I already began to accept that every Bayonetta is just gonna die in this game. Tra la 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 la. I no longer care to see the connection each Bayonetta had with their respective worlds when their inevitable deaths are just around the corner. The moment when I knew for sure I was pretty much over this part was the France section, where you find out French Bayonetta's partner in crime is her mother Rosa. Yes, Mama Rosa comes back in the game and we are forced to kill her due to the homunculi possessing her body seeing Rosa die again was the only other time where the game struck a chord in my heart because not only is Rosa known to be the most powerful Umbra witch, she is also influential in making Bayonetta the person, the woman, the witch that she is. She's Bayonetta's literal role model. Even the Bayonetta we control is once again overwhelmed with emotion seeing Rosa appear once again, but what threw me for a loop is after you defeat Rosa, the homunculi instantly attack Bayonetta, a random dance number takes place with the possessed soldiers, and honestly, I'm still upset that I actually predicted that a thriller inspired dance number would happen. You know what would go perfect in this scene? Like the intro of the thriller. Hey. 
And the game continues on as if her mom just wasn't folded like an omelet eight seconds ago. Again, there's nothing wrong with adding emotional scenes in a media that is known to be more comedic. Even the first two Bayonetta games had emotional scenes, but the difference between the first two games and Bayonetta 3 is that the emotional scenes in Bayonetta 1 and 2 fuels Bayonetta's resolve and are integral to who she is as a person. They are also given weight and the space to process before moving on to the next scene. In Bayonetta 3, the emotional scenes are instead mere plot points that don't seem to affect this Bayonetta for some odd reason. And it's jarring to observe because I'm just saying, if I saw five different versions of myself, my bestie and another version of my mom die, I'd be in a cushion room shouting the shadows remain cast nonstop. The game wants these vulnerable moments to make an impact, but at the same time robs them of their value and heavy weight. The more the story progresses, the game left me with more and more questions rather than solve them. For one, who is Sigurd? Why does the Sigurd guy decide to destroy all of the multiverses and all of the universe of humanity? Why is he specifically targeting Bayonetta? And why does she and Luca have these weird code names like Ark Eve Origin and Ark Adam? How the hell did Luca become Heidelin all of a sudden? Who the hell is Luke Kion? How the fuck did Luca also become Demonic Butterfly Werewolf Man? How did Luca get this power? And how is Viola the new Bayonetta for a universe that's not even originally her? Fortunately, most of this is explained when you go to the character section and read the profiles of each character. However, this can be easily missed because I didn't even realize until I finished the game that the character section had not only expanded from the starting cast from the prologue, but it was also expanding as the game went on or probably from what it seemed like only expanded once I completed the game. I don't remember getting any notifications within the game of unlocking these character profiles as I was playing Bayonetta, but still the character section was the farthest thing from my mind as I was progressing through the game with all of the chaotic and apocalyptic shit that was going on. I don't know why they changed this approach that they set up in Bayonetta 1 and 2 where journal entries were collectibles out in the world and you collected them while traversing through locations so you were given some kind of awareness if you wanted to know why the story is shaped how it is. Instead, a majority of the story that's going to give you really, really good context as to what's going on is tucked away in a section that you wouldn't even consider to think second about. This section I felt compelled to include because while playing Bayonetta 3 and finishing it, I wanted to gauge the community's thoughts on how they felt about Bayonetta 3 now that it's finally out. Which funnily enough, became controversy number 3 for this game, thus completing the trifecta of what, what could, could possibly, possibly go, go wrong. wrong. Now warning, this section is going to be spoilerific heavy, so please skip to the verdict section if you plan on playing Bayonetta 3 sometime soon, or stay if you want to hear the tea. The controversy surrounding the ending to Bayonetta 3 involves people being disgruntled at the ending not about by what has been previously established about Bayonetta. In the end, the Bayonetta we control ultimately meets her demise like her multiverse counterparts, with her soul being knocked out of her body, but not before Luca appears again and it's revealed Bayonetta has been in love with Luca, which naturally leads to us finding out Luca and Bayo were playing Limbo in the bedroom, <laughs> resulting in Viola's creation. After their souls are dragged down to Inferno in a weird twist on Romeo and Juliet, we find a shadow Bayonetta who tests Viola and with the villain defeated this universe is somehow reset with almost everyone back to life with the new Bayonetta now being Viola who somehow manages to look like a hipster with a rough draft of a book that initially started off as Harry Potter fan fiction sitting on her laptop hard drive. Now I will admit, I was not initially happy about the ending and shockingly as a bisexual myself, it wasn't because of Luca knocking Bayonetta's ankles into the next dimension. Because contrary to controversial beliefs, this Bayonetta falling in love with Luca actually makes sense. Hey, hey, you put that pitchfork down and you, you take that tiki torch back to Lowe's. Hear me out for a second. It makes sense when you keep in mind that this story is told with the concept of multiverses being the theme, meaning anything is possible. Hell, for all we know, there is a multiverse where Bayonetta is married to Enzo. And I think I speak for Enzo when I say, I don't think any of us want to see that outcome. Interestingly, not even the multiverse plot dictates Bayonetta and Luca getting together is a one-off odd since Viola's mother is a Bayonetta from a different universe. Contrary to popular belief, however, there is enough evidence towards the end of Bayonetta 1 and her interactions with Luca and Bayonetta 2 that indicates Bayonetta might not have been in love with Luca yet, but she was warming up to considering him an acquaintance. So the possibility of it expanding further beyond that is not surprising. I also want people to remember, despite Kamiya's supposed words about Bayonetta would never commit to Luca since he's a human, Kamiya said these words back in 2009. It's been 13 years, people. I did. Yes. 
thoughts and opinions can change in a decade. Certainly enough to retcon Luca into being the descendant of a fairy, I guess. One should never become so enamored with their own headcanon and projection of what they want a piece of media they don't own to be that they forget to realize they don't own the very media nor do they have the power to determine how that media is handled. Bayonetta is Platinum's property and if they decide to make Luca and Bayonetta do the vertical tango, then it has been decided. Personally, I don't care for Bayonetta and Luca getting together because honestly, I'm still confused at the poor execution of the story, the random departure from the Lumen Sage and Umber Witch lore that most fans actually enjoy to this weird, uninspired, boring mess of a wannabe Marvel Cinematic Universe multiverse sci-fi concept, and this odd shoe-in for making Viola the new main character of Bayonetta going forward. If we're gonna address something, let's really address the elephant in the room and how a certain someone at Platinum just can't let go of their involvement with Devil May Cry, that I'm more concerned about Bayonetta still residing in Devil May Cry's shadow rather than Luca losing his virginity to Bayonetta. Now we have reached the final destination, the crossroad in the convoluted Tessieverse that acts to play or not to play. And my answer is Bayonetta 3 falls underneath the same verdict I gave Astral Chain. The only difference is I cannot stress enough that you must play this game solely for its gameplay and amazing combat system. Or if you love the character Bayonetta herself and appreciate what she brings to the table as a dummy mommy, unlike Astral Chain which can stand on its own as a standalone game and has a story that doesn't really require that much of a commitment. Bayonetta 3 has a few continuity issues about it where even if you played the first two Bayonettas for context, there's only so much information you can use to grasp at what the hell is going on because Bayonetta 3 is literally we're gonna do whatever the fuck we want the game. And judging from the ending of this Bayonetta, it looks like the next Bayonetta installment is going to continue within this particular universe, the Brave Cereza universe. Woo! Now that I've finally gotten all of this off my chest, I can finally put the multiverse of driving me mad behind me. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so that the whispers of destiny can notify you when more videos drop. Please leave your thoughts and comments down below if you finished Bayonetta 3 yourself or if you too need refuge from the clusterfuck that it is. Until the next video, stay safe, stay healthy, and don't forget to buy avocados when you go to the grocery store.